this case is so solvable. There's 10 times more clues in this case than you ever had in Claremont. Uh, and if you get the right team uh, with the right material in the right place and the WA police back out, this can still be solved. Welcome back to Court in the Act. Last week, we began our examination of the case of Lloyd Patrick Rainey versus the state of Western Australia. It was one of the most contentious murder investigations in the history of this state, and still is. One of the most scrutinised murder trials in living memory, ending with Mr Rainey being acquitted of murder and manslaughter. And that extraordinary day allowed him to speak on the steps of court in front of a throng of journalists, the likes of which I have rarely seen anywhere in the world. It was uh, five years ago, it's hard to measure, it's half a decade uh, uh, that Corin tragically died. It's been five years since uh, Sarah and Caitlin have been without their mum. They still don't know, and we still don't know, what happened to Corin, and that is, that is a terrible tragedy. Also part of that melee outside the court building was Robin Napper, the former British homicide detective and forensic investigator who had been part of the defence team for Mr Rainey. Robin, thanks for joining us again, mate. Hi, Tim. It's a pleasure. Uh, your memories of that throng outside the court? It was like, uh, I don't know, royal family. It was extraordinary, wasn't it? We were swept along in a wave of people, really. <laughs> um, I think my biggest memory was the fact that, as an ex-cop, the killers were still on the loose. Yeah. You know, there'd been this massive, sh almost show trial and, and money being spent, time, energy, and yet the, the killers were still on the loose. And um, don't forget, Tim, there were a lot of very senior public people in WA who thought that uh, Lloyd effectively got away with it because mm. some of them have confronted me since about it, about my involvement. So there was a strong feeling against him still. Yeah. And with all the resources they put in, um, it was obviously sort of a massive blow to, to, to Corinne's immediate family, her sister, her father, who spent a lot of time at court and we were also obviously at court that day. But it was also a bit of an embarrassment for the for WA police, particularly, I'm sure, when they started reading some of Justice Martin's comments about uh, some of his thinking on, on, on what they'd done um, throughout parts of the investigation. No, he didn't spare anyone, did he? <laughs> um, I was obviously only concerned about the police investigation and the fact that it's probably the worst investigation I've ever been involved in in 40 years. There was so much went wrong, was, was, was done wrong, and there was so much unfinished business mm. that still has not been put right. So that verdict left serious stains on all sides. Police prosecutors and accused. Justice Martin, in delivering his verdict, found serious holes in the prosecution case. He said evidence of the discovery of a third seed pod in that body bag left me with a distinct feeling of unease. He said the major problem with the prosecution's theory of how Mrs Rainey was killed at home was the absence of any evidence to support it. Big absence and the window of the time for him to carry out this murder. A very limited opportunity in extremely risky circumstances, Justice Martin concluded. For Mr Rainey's part, the judge was also highly critical of some of his behaviour prior to his wife's murder, in particular placing listening devices in the house they shared. Mr Rainey was so anxious to get what is collo colloquially known as inside information that he was prepared to engage in an unlawful activity, which was the antithesis of the ethical conduct expected of a legal practitioner and which, if discovered, would jeopardise his legal career, Justice Martin said. Even if the accused said that whatever was done had to be lawful and legal, I am satisfied that such a statement would have been disingenuous. 
The importance of the evidence lies in the fact that, notwithstanding his position in the legal profession, the accused was willing to go to considerable lengths and expense to engage in an illegal activity to achieve his purpose. And as for the police, Justice Martin also had some stinging criticism. As is apparent from the discussion concerning various aspects of the conduct of police investigators, there are instances of conduct ranging from inappropriate to reprehensible, he said. They included the infamous press conference given by Detective Jack Lee, where he labelled Mr Rainey the prime and only suspect in his wife's murder. The treatment of witness Claire O'Neill, another lawyer, who told the trial she was threatened with professional ruin by police if she didn't cooperate. The impression of experienced senior pathologist Dr Jared Cadden of the police, who also voiced his unease in asking him to change a crucial report. And the very public arrest of Mr Rainey. I reject the explanations as to the place of arrest and the need to handcuff the accused, Justice Martin said. They can appropriately be described as arrant nonsense. The evidence compels a conclusion that police decided to put on a show of force with officers wearing vests in a busy city street close to the Supreme Court to humiliate the accused in public. Robin, the comments from the judge, they didn't miss anyone, really. Uh, no, he didn't. Um, obviously, I was only concerned with what he said about the police's role. Um, because after 40 years investigating, this was frankly the worst investigation I'd ever come across. And uh, no, the uh, the judge nailed it. He, he <laughs> saw it and he published it. So it's out yeah. there for everyone to read. Yeah. And we've discussed this on Court in the Act before. The, the, uh, the beauty, I suppose, of the judge alone trial is that a judge has to publish his reasons, very detailed reasons as to the as to the verdict he's arrived at, whereas a jury, obviously, 12 and, you know, fair and good women and men go into a, a room, lock the door, come up with a decision, and we never know why, because we're not allowed to ask them. Um, and and this judgment, as you said, 630-odd pages, I mean, so detailed. I've been going through it, preparing for, the, for our conversation this week. It's so detailed. It gives a sense of... The, the amount of material that you were talking about in the, in the last episode that you had to go through, but then the judge has got to sift through it all himself and make a decision. I mean, it's uh, it, 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 he he really did have a massive job on his hands, Justice Martin. I I, I wonder now whether he <laughs> regrets picking up that phone call from uh, from the Attorney General. Well, of course, also Tim, from our perspective, because he's published reasons, we realise that our uh, forensic approach and our tactics in the trial, although may have been considered risky by some, were absolutely spot on. Mm. I mean, you know, David Eberson just nailed it, which is why he's probably the best barrister I've ever worked with in uh, in in WA. He 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 just nailed it at the court, and um, yeah, the judge accepted it and gave reasons for his acceptance. Mm. And so, you know, talk, talk us through some of those. Did, did, tactical discussions. I mean, uh, as you say, your part in it was looking at what the police did, making sure or, or trying to make sure that they'd done everything by the book and where they hadn't to point it out. Um, on the other side, David Edwardson, Clint Hampson, Laura uh, Timpano, as she was then, they, they were all about the law. Uh, um, how, how did you meet in the middle there with, with, with coming up for, for, for the arguments that you were going to make or David was going to make in court? Uh, that's very simple. I literally go through the case from my perspective. I produce the ammunition and I put it on the table of David Edwardson and Tony Elliott they make all the decisions 100% how they will use that in court. That is nothing to do with me. Mm. So this is what we found. Uh, this is how we think it got there. And we'll mm. explain to you how, like, like the seed pods, it is entirely a matter for them how they conduct the court proceedings. Mm. So it wasn't difficult at all. It, it, uh, it worked like clockwork as a team. Mm. It was very, very good. 
So, as you can imagine, the fallout from this verdict was tempestuous. Within days, the Legal Practice Board and Barristers Board announced that they would be reviewing Mr Rainey's privilege to practice in their profession. He then shut down his legal practice. The criticism of the police's behaviour almost demanded a response from the police commissioner, which so far had not been forthcoming. And then the state appealed the verdict. That appeal hearing finished on the sixth anniversary of Mrs Rainey's disappearance, with prosecutors arguing the judge had not considered the circumstantial evidence as a whole. By contrast, Mr Rainey's legal team made their own argument that the judge actually could have and should have concluded the seed pods found in Mrs Rainey's hair were planted there by police. Almost a year on from his first acquittal came another, with the state's highest court upholding the acquittal of Lloyd Rainey on murder. He was obviously relieved. His wife's family was obviously devastated. The ripples from the Rainey Pond continued. Defamation claims continued. Legal challenges to the phone tapping charges that came before the murder charge were also made. And then, in 2014, Mr Rainey finally spoke at length, telling the Seven Network of his living nightmare. On every level imaginable, things were beyond worse. I, I, I can't describe how awful things have been. And there was another contributor to that documentary, Robin Napper, who made on camera some startling claims. At least two other men should have been investigated just as thoroughly as Lloyd Rainey to eliminate them from being persons of interest. Robin, you named a couple of chaps on the television that you said police should have looked at more closely uh, and you didn't just pick these names out of the air. We, we certainly didn't in that they came to us during disclosure and to give your listeners an idea of... of, of why we came to our decision, um, shortly after Corin disappeared, they, they searched the, uh, the verge way outside the house and they found a number of cigarette butts. And they DNA'd these butts and they got a hit on one uh, of an individual who had the most extensive rap sheet you could think of, which included sexual crimes, violent crimes, and who had previously been acquitted of murder. Now, you would think that finding something like this in the early days of a murder investigation would warrant serious investigation. Never happened. Uh, he was subsequently interviewed the following year for about 15 minutes, and it was just a waste of time. Uh, his house was never forensically examined, his clothing, uh, his phone. He, he was never seriously looked at because the police had decided in their own minds that this was all Lloyd. Now, this was compounded, Tim, during the trial. Mm -hmm. Because during the trial, we, the defence, were still getting disclosure material. Mm -hmm. And we had disclosed to us um, a traffic infringement stop from a general duties officer on the night that Corin went missing. And this disclosed that an individual with the same surname and giving the car number and the type of car, had been breathalyzed close to the Bentley Community Centre 15 minutes before Corin was last seen alive and left the centre. Mm. Now, even the DPP didn't know about that. <laughs> so that weekend, there were frantic uh, uh, requests to the police to go and track down this car and find out where it happened. It all came to nothing because mm. it didn't affect Lloyd's trial. Mm. But the police knew about all of this in 2007 and effectively kept it not only from the DP, but kept it from us as well. So this was an indication of there must be a lot more material in there that still has not yet been either disclosed or looked at. So a fresh focus and calls for a fresh inquiry with whispers of that starting in late 2014 undertaken by the WA police. 
investigating their own investigation. Calls for an independent inquiry into the case grew after Mr Rainey was acquitted for a second time, this time of phone-tapping charges, those ones brought by the Commonwealth. A judge ruled there wasn't enough evidence and threw the prosecution out. And outside that court, Sarah Rainey, Lloyd and Corinne's youngest daughter, spoke out. He's dealt with such accusations that nobody should ever have to deal with, and it's time for that to end. He's been proven to have done nothing wrong so many times, and he's held himself with grace through, through the worst accusations imaginable. It's time for that to stop, and it's time for justice to be served for my mother. Following that acquittal, WA Police publicly accepted and launched a cold case review of Operation Dargan to be undertaken by WA Police, investigating their own investigation. The internal review being carried out by homicide detectives was shut down. And while Mr Rainey said he would cooperate with that inquiry, he was also continuing to fight police with his defamation action, while also fighting to save his legal career following the cancellation of his right to practice law. That was over his conduct in secretly recording his wife and then lying to a magistrate about it. In that fight, Mr Rainey gave evidence in public for the first time. His emotions spilled over when he said he was sure the police had fitted him up. And in the defamation trial, which eventually finally began in early 2017, it was Mr Rainey making the accusations that... That 20-minute press conference where he had been labelled the prime and only suspect ruined a career 20 years in the making. Robin, the defamation trial, it also gave police another crack at airing what they claimed uh, had made Lloyd their, their primary target. Yes, I was at that trial as well, Tim, and sat through it all. Uh, it was quite extraordinary. We had... Detective after detective from the Dargun team giving their explanations about how they were so right and everyone else was so wrong. Mm. Um, but unfortunately for them, we had Martin Bennett representing us, who is a fearsome advocate uh, in these types of proceedings. And he just took them apart one by one. Uh, it's all in the transcript. You can read it. And really, to use the words of the original trial judge, Martin showed that all their theories were just arrant nonsense. Mm. Well, two things there. Yes, I can um, attest to Martin Bennett being a fearsome advocate. And the one thing you never want to see in your inbox on any morning or evening is a, is a letter uh, from Bennett and Co. Because uh, you know your life's about to get a lot harder. But in that trial in particular... Um, Martin obviously specialises in defamation, but he but he is a he's an advocate number one, and uh, you, you could see his his um, I won't say creative juices, but it's, it's certainly his, the, the, any criminal juices that he might had have had um, they were they were brought to the fore, and he certainly I think maybe enjoyed not the wrong word, but relished actually g getting to question some of these very, se well, the most senior detectives in Dargan um, and basically call them out on, on what they were saying. Um, and at one point, basically accused them, oh, well, you're, I mean, you're just using this court to make your accusations knowing that you can't get sued for them again. Yes, uh, yes, it did. Martin was able to come at this from a different angle, from the defamation angle, which means he was looking at some material a lot deeper than we needed mm. to in the criminal case. Yeah. But what he uncovered showed an even bigger witch hunt against Lloyd than even we realised. Um, I won't go into it on this podcast, but there there's some very disturbing things that were done uh, to, to try and nail Lloyd, which um, they were called out on, mm. and they didn't like it, Tim. No, no they did not. <laughs> mm -hmm. The, so the, the, the shopping list of suspicions, as I said, by police, they aired them in court um, in a bid to try and show that they were um, justified in, in, or Jack Lee was justified in what he said at that press conference. Included in those was a belief 
that the attack was not random and that a random attacker would not go to such lengths to bury a body. They pointed to statistically that husbands were most likely to be the killers of their wives. Uh, this particular husband, they said, and wife were in a toxic relationship. Um, they said Mr Rainey had refused to give a statement and had not agreed to his daughters Caitlin and Sarah being interviewed again. And that he went back to the physical evidence. Brick particles on her boots and liquid amber seed pods in her hair were cited. And interestingly, there was also the hitman theory. Police confirmed in the defamation court that a prison whisper from convicted murderer Frank Roberts said that Mr Rainey had allegedly hired a man to kill his wife. And those whispers were taken very seriously by police. The supposed assassin had his house raided, a phone tap put in place, and his car seized. But the money trail police went looking for just wasn't there. In that defamation court, witness after witness stated their belief that Mr Rainey was guilty, including the in-laws, who he said hated him, and the police who obviously pursued him. The police said naming Mr Rainey as their suspect was merely telling the truth and they had the suspicions to back it up. What Justice John Cheney saw, though, and concluded when he eventually ruled was WA Police, very early on, had very many police officers who had made up their minds that Lloyd Rainey was guilty. I am satisfied that by the end of August, the police involved in the investigation construed events and information that they learned with a suspicious bias rather than objectively. Each of those witnesses was at pains to construe every snippet of information they had as pointing to Mr Rainey's involvement with his wife's murder. Many of the matters that they relied upon as pointing to Mr Rainey's guilt were at best equivocal, simply not probative of anything, or inconsistent with any cogent case theory. And he said that they had obviously, or very probably, been influenced by the very early belief expressed strongly by Mrs Rainey's family and friends that Mr Rainey was involved in her death. And it was clear that some of the police officers, Justice Cheney said, in particular, DS Correa and DSS Lee, appeared anxious to take the opportunity to, in effect, publicly reinforce the suggestion that Mr Rainey was involved in the murder of his wife. Justice Cheney found that Lloyd Rainey had been defamed and he eventually awarded him... $2.6 million in damages and lost earnings. Essentially what this case has been about for the last 10 years was vindicate his reputation, establish categorically that the press conference given by Detective Sergeant Jack Lee was improper, it was a tortious wrong, it uh, conveyed his honour found, we think, entirely accurately, the, the, a dreadful imputation. A winner, but obviously so much lost. Mr Rainey appealed against that damages claim, saying he should have got more, and he lost. He appealed against a decision to remove his practising law licence, and lost, meaning he'd lost his career as well. And then, a bid for a public inquest into the death of Mrs Rainey was also rejected by the state coroner, leaving two families and an entire community lost for an answer as to who did kill Corinne Rainey. Robin, you've been vocal uh, internally and externally for so long that those answers are there if the police would be willing to reinvestigate them. Big sticking point, Tim. The WA police have got to take themselves right out of the equation mm. And they've got to follow world's best practice is that you call in an independent team and you make 
everything, and I mean everything, forensics, material, casework, available to the fresh team with no input from the original police service. Mm. That's never happened in WA yet. It could happen if the new police commissioner and the police minister want this to happen, but to date, that's never been a reality. Mm. And obviously, forensic material should be there, what well, hopefully would would still be there in a box somewhere that that could, that could be poured over obviously in the in the in the Claremont case quite famously there was a forensic audit done which actually found those clean fingernails which eventually proved to be the be the uh, the, the tiny morsel that cracked open the biggest case of all um so a, a you'd hope for, hope that WA police had kept them and b would then you know they might you never know um you know, wield some sort of clue? Oh, I pray that these exhibits are still available, Tim. And secondly, I I just hope they're all kept in the right conditions. If you don't keep forensic material in the right conditions, they will deteriorate, degrade, and they won't be any good. Um, This case is so solvable. Mm. There's ten times more clues in this case than you ever had in Claremont. Uh, and if you get the right team uh, with the right material in the right place and the WA police back out, this can still be solved. I, I'm confident that before I fall off the perch, Tim, we will get a result in this case. I do hope so. One of those leads, I think, personally, is that that, I mean, that oil trail, I just keep going back to it as the, as the, the police went back to it, um, which le- obviously led to the, the major discovery. It's quite miraculous because it, it led to the body all those years ago. And part of that oil trail, um, as we wrote about in the West Australian last year, it spilt into a car park at, at May Drive, which is just off Kings Park Drive. And pictures um, that you know I've subsequently seen taken by the police on, on the evening show, show that oil trail clearly in that car park and there's a there's a tire track that has gone through that oil as well which has left an, an incredible imprint but the question i keep going back to is what why why was mrs rainey's car there in that car park because it's not on the direct route between the burial site where her body was found and the site where the car conked out and this little detour, Robin, uh, looking through the judgments and looking through the, you know, the, 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 you know, all the, all the, all the stories written about this case, that's never really been explained to me. Why, why the car went there? This was airbrushed out of the trial, Tim. The trial against Lloyd Rainey was that having buried his wife in Kings Park after the murder. He had reversed out of that track and the concrete block that had secured the post came up, severed the bolt on the gearbox and the oil started to drip out. And they said he was driving the car, made it as far as Haytesbury Avenue, where he abandoned the car. So it's airbrushed out the trial. The trial judge, the appeal judges, knew nothing about this. Mm. So what is common knowledge is that the oil drip started after Corin had been buried. Mm -hmm. The drip that goes then all round King's Park, and it goes into the May Drive car park, where it drives around, and as you say, the car tyres come back on itself. It stays there for a small amount of time because of the amount of oil. It then drives off to where it's eventually found in Subiaco. Now, when the car was found eight days later, and they followed that trail during the night, they got all the way back to May Drive. And the team that night photographed it. Um, they, they taped it off and left it for the day shift. So they had stopped in May Drive because the car had clearly gone there. Mm. In the morning, a forensic team started searching. They found that down the side of the toilet block, there was a, a limestone track. And I know that there were limestone particles found under the mud guards of the car. So there, there was a correlation with mm. that. And they had photographed partial tyre impressions along that track. And I know it's eight days later, but hey, this is a homicide. No stone gets left unturned. You really go for it. Um, so it's quite 
conceivable to me that the car had actually gone to May Drive in the first instant, driven down that limestone track where poor Corinne was attacked in the back of the car, and during the course of this sexual attack, she had actually died. Died very suddenly, very unexpectedly. So the the killers, they were then faced with not having a, um, a, a sex victim. They had a dead body. So they decided to drive then from May Drive car park round the other side of Kings Park to bury her. And as they came out in her car, that's when they severed the, 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 um, the gearbox oil. Now, that then went back there. There was at least two people in that car, Tim. There was more sand in the driver, in the passenger seat than the driver's seat. You know, the, the, this theory that Lloyd was on his own, you can just look in the car. There was at least two people in there. Mm -hmm. So they've gone back to May Drive car park, theoretically. Uh, they've swapped back in their original cars. They decided to take Corin's car away, but the vehicle management system has shut it down because there's too much oil has been left and they had yep. to abandon it. Yep. it. Look, it's a theory, Tim. Mm. There is forensic evidence that's been gathered there, but like so much other, it's never been investigated. So I started this two-part episode saying that everyone's got an opinion um, on the Lloyd Rainey case. So having listened to Robin today, read all the judgments, looked back on all the evidence that was known and made public, I'm going to give you an opinion of my own. How about this? That Bentley Community Centre, we know, was prone to petty crime. Mrs Rainey was an attractive woman on her own in the dark. And it is beyond doubt we know her car was used in her murder. What if, as Robin says, Mrs Rainey was accosted in that car park? and then attacked in her car by more than one man. The motive is most likely sexual. The evidence points to that, given her belt was found unbuckled when her body was uncovered and part of the jeans zipper had been ripped away. That attacker, or attackers, with Mrs Rainey subdued on her own back seat, now drive somewhere close, but quiet, continue that attack. One attacker takes Mrs. Rainey's car. The other has a car of their own. Why else would they have been in a community centre car park in the first place? The closest, darkest spot is Kings Park. Just off Kings Park Avenue is the car park on May Drive. And off that car park is a limestone pathway leading to a small body of water. There were traces of limestone found on Mrs. Rainey's car when it was analysed, just as Robin just said. Could it be that the killers took Mrs Rainey to May Drive first, drove up that limestone pathway to continue their attack? And that is where, somehow, she has died. We know she did die in Kings Park because traces of pollen in her nose show she took her final breaths there. And now the killers need to get rid of her, to bury her. So they drive to the other side of the car park, to do so. When they have finished that grim task, they drive back to the May Drive car park where the attack began, leaving the oil trail as they go to maybe check they haven't left any incriminating evidence behind. As Justice Brian Martin said in summing up his not guilty verdict, sometimes an apparently implausible explanation is true. Human affairs are not like jigsaws cut to size and shape. Strange events happen for odd reasons. And mysteries emanating from evidence given in criminal cases remain unsolved. Robin, uh, what do you think of my theory there? Are you going to shoot it down like you shot down the prosecutors all those years ago? Well, it almost matches my one that has not yet been investigated. And they still have material, if they've kept that, Tim, that I can prove or disprove what you and I have just said. Thanks so much for joining us on Court in the Act, mate. I, you know how much I appreciate you coming on here. Um, we've talked about this case for many years, but for you to share it with our listeners um, is... is uh, 
yeah, a, a real a real pleasure. So thanks very much. Let's hope we get a result in the future, Tim. Thank you. As I always say, you can contact us here at Court in the Act at wanews.com.au. We'll be back next week. And remember, if you want to know what's going on in court, don't get caught short. Get caught in the act instead. See you soon. 